We're going to get a little geeky today to talk about how our founding fathers had a broader conception of human freedom and liberty than did our English ancestors. And the fact that, yes, indeed, the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms derives in part from some English laws, it's not the same as English laws. In fact, the conception of the right to keep and bear arms is much broader than those envisioned by our English ancestors. This is important. Stay tuned. Let's talk about why. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owners, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. A lot of lessons there for Americans from the experience of the Ukrainian people, including the fact they had a chance to adopt a Second Amendment 10 years ago and chose not to do it with consequences that they're experiencing today. Okay, folks, we're going to get a little intellectual here. So we're going to go a little slower. It's not going to be a long video, but it's an important video. We know that the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms is not created by the right to keep and bear arms as set forth in the Second Amendment. Specifically, the mere fact that the Second Amendment talks about the right, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, that is not what creates our right to keep and bear arms. The Supreme Court has repeatedly said, and it's always been understood, that the text of the Second Amendment codifies or memorializes rights that pre-existed the document itself, which was created and went into effect in 1791. But Americans already had the right to keep their arms before the year of our Lord, 1791. So what does this, all this mean, and how do you conceptually understand this? Because I think it's important there's, that you understand a few specific points about how our founding fathers envision certain fundamental rights, including the right to bear arms. Specifically, I'd like to start with what the United States Supreme Court has said about this, because they're all deep intellectuals, they're serious scholars, they've looked at the record, they looked at the history. So in 2008, the Supreme Court issued its decision, of course, in Heller versus the District of Columbia that said, you and I have a right, an individual right to keep and bear arms. It's not a collective right, it's an individual right, which obviously is pretty clear from the text of the Constitution and the Second Amendment. But beyond that, it goes on to say that we have a right to a loaded handgun unlocked in the home in anticipation of self-defense and for all lawful purposes. But, but specifically, in reaching that result, the Supreme Court wrote the following. Specifically, it said that indeed the Second Amendment was about codifying a pre-existing right. This is what the Supreme Court wrote. Not me, not the Four Boxes Diner, but the Supreme Court. It says, quote, We, the Supreme Court, we look to this historical background. That's what they're referring to. We look to this historical background because it has always been widely understood that the Second Amendment, like the First and Fourth Amendments, codified a pre-existing right. The very text of the Second Amendment implicitly recognizes the pre-existence of the right and declares only that it shall not be infringed. And again, if you just look at the text for a moment and read it, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, right? So right of the people to keep and bear arms, talking about something that exists. And then what, what is the government commanded to do? The answer is it's commanded to not infringe, right? Shall not be infringed, but it's talking about a pre-existing right. That's clearly the case textually. That's what the history teaches us. And that's what the Supreme Court in Heller teaches us. Now, here is where I watch, this is where the rub is though. It's not bad, it's just something I want you to be aware of. It's very important because I don't want you to get duped or confused if some anti-gunner intellectual tries to play a game that goes like this. They say, hey, you always say that the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms protects a pre-existing right. Well, we know, and it's true, that the English Declaration of Rights, sometimes referred to as the English Declaration or the Bill of Rights, that it came about in 1689 after the Glorious Revolution, it was limited. Specifically, the right to bear arms in the English Declaration of Rights of 1689 said the following, quote, that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions, and as allowed by law, period, close quote. 
And they will also point out, and this is, by the way, why the English ultimately lost the right to keep and bear arms. We'll, we'll do a whole video on that at some point. And the English Declaration of Rights only limited the powers of the king, of the crown, not parliament, which, again, is how the English ultimately lost the right to keep and bear arms because it didn't bind this declaration from 1689, only bound the king. It did not bound the parliament. Okay. Now, the reason why I reference this to... Uh, that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense is that the founding fathers did not view the Second Amendment that limited because the founding fathers had a broader conception of liberty than did our English ancestors. And I think there's really four reasons for why our founding fathers that gave rise to gave us the Declaration of Independence, of course, and gave us the Bill of Rights had a broader conception of what freedom meant from government than did the English, our English ancestors that had been lorded over for centuries by various forms of kings and despots. First of all, keep in mind that the Americans that came here colonized this country. They built the country. They settled the country, right? Okay, number one. Number two, they were used to being self-reliant and ruling themselves. We were here. London was a whole ocean away. Americans did what they needed to do in a form of self-reliance and independence that many European serfs did not have experience with. So the Americans here had a much different view on life and the role of government than did those perhaps living in London. Third, of course, the Americans were used to fighting for what they needed to get. They had to do, many of them had to survive with firearms. They had to hunt with firearms. They had to kill wild animals with firearms. They had to deal with, you know, raiding Indians. That's not my language. That's actually the language of Justice uh, of Justice Anthony Kennedy in the Heller case that made this exact observation when he was cross-examining the District of Columbia's attorney when he said, well, did the founding fathers, the, the, the remote settlers, did they need firearms for criminals, for animals, for grizzly bears, for wolves, and for raiding Indians? I mean, again, this is what Justice Kennedy understood um, right there back in the Heller case. And of course, last but not least is here in America, we weren't used to being bullied by kings because we were a whole ocean away from the king, specifically King George III. So for all the these reasons, I think the Founding Fathers had a grander, broader conception of liberty, and that showed through in various ways. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how it showed through in the context of the Second Amendment, but then I'm going to show you that it was also the case with other parts of the Bill of Rights, not just the right to bear in arms, bear arms, but it was also true for other aspects of the Bill of Rights as well. So again, certainly when it came to the right to keep and bear arms, notice that the English Declaration of Rights from 16. Uh, 89 talks about the subjects which are Protestants. So the right to bear arms in England was limited to Protestants because they feared that the Catholics were a danger to the realm. And keep in mind that the reason why the English Declaration of Rights came about in 1689 was because of the Glorious Revolution, which required essentially kicking the Catholic king off the throne and allowing William and Mary Protestants to come over and start to rule as the king and queen of England. Okay, so the American Second Amendment doesn't limit the right to keep and bear arms to a particular religion, right? It applies to all the people. That's why it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. While in England, it talks about the rights of the Protestants, okay? The second thing is there's these other languages here about subject conditions and as allowed by law. It only applies again to uh, the king. We, in the Second Amendment, don't have those limitations, right? It applied to government. Beyond that, I also, and this is why it also comes up, is in the context of banning AR-15s. You will sometimes see in op-eds and articles. Now, to me, this is an attempt to dupe people and to confuse people into what the law is not. Specifically, as you know, the law is, if a firearm is in common use for lawful purposes, it's protected, cannot be banned. That obviously includes AR-15s and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, of which they're clearly in common use in America. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because sometimes the anti-gunners will like to quote the following language from William Blackstone. William Blackstone was a very famous and influential British lawyer at the time of our founding. Now, William Blackstone is most famous for something called Blackstone's Commentaries. The English had, by and large, what's known as a common law system, which means their law 
came about by virtue of decisions by judges, and those decisions would be published. What William Blackstone did as a commentator is he would go around the country, he would collect these common law decisions by judges, he would read them all, and then he would summarize or synthesize them in the context of this book called William Blackstone's Commentaries. And that summary of English law, that book, was brought to America by, our, by, among others, the Founding Fathers and before, and that served as basically the baseline law of the original United States because we all consider ourselves in America, initially at least, as Englishmen, and therefore the English law set forth by William Commentary, who derived it by summarizing English law generally, was kind of our first law here in the country. So with that background in mind, and you're like, why do I care about this mark? Well, the Supreme Court really trusts William Blackstone and has cited him repeatedly in the context of the Second Amendment. But this is specifically why you care about Bl William Blackstone and how I'm going to solve a potential problem for you in one second that William Blackstone wrote the following in his commentaries on the laws of England that the anti-gunners have tried to use against us, and I'm going to show you how to quickly rebut it. So what William Blackstone wrote in his, this is what he wrote in his book, quote, the offense of riding or going armed with dangerous or unusual weapons is a crime against the public peace by terrifying the good people of the land and is particularly prohibited by the statute of Northampton. Okay, hear what I just said. I'm going to read it to you close. It's going to hear that word or. I want you to listen for the word or, as in not and, but or. Again, William Blackstone in his book, it was brought over to the United States from England, which summarized English law, said the following. William Blackstone described English law this way. Quote, the offense of riding or going armed going armed with dangerous or or unusual weapons is a crime against the public peace by terrifying the good people of the land and is particularly prohibited by the statute of Northampton. Now, that is how he described that crime, dangerous or unusual weapons. Now, I want you to, this is important because I want you to contrast what the English commentator from England William Blackstone interpreting English law said in his Blackstone commentaries that dangers or unusual weapons. And I want that contrasted with the United States Supreme Court interpretation of the relevant law of America at the time of our founding, of the United States at the time of our founding. So in the context of setting up the in common use standard, which is very favorable for the Second Amendment right now. They point out that the Supreme Court decision in Miller said, as we explained, that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. But here's he continued, this is what the Supreme Court says, and Miller carries on, quote, we think that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition, this is key, of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons citing the Blackstone. Do you see what just happened there? We think that the limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. So the United States Supreme Court views the proper interpretation of the relevant law at the time of our founding as a conjunctive test, meaning a weapon for it to be even conceptually banned has to be both dangerous and unusual, and by definition, if it's in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, it cannot possibly be unusual because it's in common use. Things that are in common use are not unusual by definition. So that's why the in common use test for lawful purposes is so powerful for us because there's simply no way on earth that anyone can claim an AR-15 or semi-automatic rifle or magazines that hold more than 10 rounds are unusual because they're clearly not. They're in common use. They're ubiquitous in this country. To carry on, that's what Heller said. They talk about dangerous and unusual weapons while Blackstone talks about dangerous or unusual weapons but the Americans talk about and unusual. And then Justice Alito and Caetano in his concurrence in 2016 wrote the following, reaffirming what I just said, which is it's a conjunctive test to even contemplate the banning of a gun. Uh, quote, as the per curiam opinion recognizes, this is a conjunctive test. A weapon may not be banned unless it is both dangerous and unusual.
Because the court rejects the lower court's conclusion that stun guns are unusual, it does not need to consider the lower court's conclusion that they are also dangerous. Do you see what just happened there? This is Justice Alito explaining the Supreme Court's test. It's very clear that the only way a weapon may contemplate it and possibly be banned is it has to be both dangerous and unusual. So I bring this up to show you that even though the English Blackstone talks about dangerous or unusual, the American conception is it's dangerous and unusual. Now, this is consistent with how our founding fathers, again, had a broader conception of freedom and liberty for humans and Americans than our English ancestors. This is not the only example where the Americans did this in the context of the Second Amendment, right? They talk about the people being protected, not just the Protestants. They talked about, you know, the right to keep and bear arms is pre-existing right, not just, you know, a, a subject to your needs or your condition in society. None of that stuff, none of those qualifications applied to the Second Amendment, although they existed in England. Now, there's other examples of this involving America's Bill of Rights. For example, in the First Amendment, you have a right to petition the government. But did you know at the time of our founding in England... Only certain people were allowed to petition the government. Not everyone in England could petition the government, only a select few. So here in the United States, the people, all Americans, have the right to petition the government under the First Amendment. But that is not the case in England at the time. Of the founding. Again, another example how the American conception of liberty and freedom from government was broader than it was at the time in England. Likewise, the right to assemble. We have a right to assembly, a right to assemble to protest um, under the First Amendment, a right to assemble as Americans to protest the government or whatnot, and it can't be limited. Now, again, if you were to do that at the time of the founding in England, in many instances, if you had too many people, even if they were acting peaceably, the mere fact there were too many people could be considered a riot that would allow people to be arrested in England. But here in the United States, the right to assembly is a broader concept and a broader construct than it was at the time in England. And of course, in America, under the First Amendment, we ban the establishment of a religion, right? There is no national religion of America. If you go to France, the national religion of France is Catholicism. If you go to England, the national religion of, of, of England is Protestantism, specifically the Church of England or the Anglican Church is the religion of, that's the state religion of England, right? Here in the United States, we specifically outlaw a national religion. That's because, again, our, our founders had a broader conception of liberty than did the British. So the British had state Religions that got funded by the state here in the United States, you can't establish a religion under the First Amendment. So under the free exercise clause of religion, which we have here in the, in the First Amendment, you can be a Protestant, you can be a Catholic, you can be a Buddhist, doesn't matter. You can be any of these religions. You have the right to exercise the religion of your choice, which is not necessarily the case at the time of the founding in places like England, where you really suffered certain disabilities legally if you were a Catholic at the time, uh, as opposed to a Protestant, because people feared that the Catholics would cause a war or work with the Spaniards to overthrow the British king and so on and so on, or the British queen in the case of Queen Elizabeth. But anyway, the point is that, again, here in the United States, our founding fathers had the broader conception of liberty, not just with the right to keep and bear arms, but also with various aspects of the First Amendment and so on and so on. So again, if any anti-gunner tries to play games to say, well, the English rights were more narrow, or it was this or that, or Blackstone had a different view. So to summarize, it's true that the American founding fathers considered themselves to be Englishmen and to have the rights of the Englishmen. But at the end of the day, they viewed themselves to have even broader protections and broader rights and broader freedom than their English ancestors. And we here in the United States today are the beneficiaries of that greater wisdom. But don't let any anti-gunner or anybody who votes against freedom to say, well, the British didn't have that at the time of the founding. So how can you say that? Because again, our founding fathers had the grander, broader conception of liberty than did our English ancestors. Okay, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today about William Blackstone and more. And uh, again, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you again soon at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.